Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tank. My name is Alan. In the most recent episode of Ahsoka, if you're sharp-eyed enough, you might have noticed this building here in one of the first scenes. Inside, Harrison Duel is attending a hearing in front of the New Republic Defense Council, a civilian-led body that seems to govern the New Republic Defense Fleet. What really surprised me was the location of this building, this very serious government or military building. It wasn't located on Hazian Prime or Chandrilla, the two capitals that the New Republic used. Instead, it was located on Coruscant, the original capital of the Galactic Republic and the capital of Palpatine's empire. This surprises me because in all of the literature and all of the lore, the New Republic tried to avoid Coruscant as much as possible. There was a serious concerted effort by Mon Mothma and senior decision makers within the New Republic hierarchy to remove the power center of the galaxy from this world. And it actually never really made any sense for me why they wouldn't visit the world of Coruscant. I mean, yes, J.J. Abrams did try to destroy Coruscant instead of Hosnian Prime in Force Awakens, but Hidalgo, Pablo Hidalgo and the story group were like, nope, we still need Coruscant for other stories in the future. But other than that, I couldn't really figure out a reason. Like, why would you not go to this amazing planet that most fans seem to like? Well, I didn't understand it until I kind of opened my mind up a little bit and thought outside the box. You see, Coruscant has the distinction of not only being a political center of the galaxy, but also the commercial and cultural center of the galaxy. And in some ways, if you take a look at the star charts, it was also the geographic center as well. Coruscant's not just Washington, D.C., it's also New York City, Chicago, and L.A. all wrapped into one giant thing. And that's because Coruscant isn't just a city, it's a planet-wide city. And its reach extends far into the heavens. I mean, you see this little tiny rock? That used to be a mountaintop. Coruscant also extends deep into the depths of the planet to its original surface, which has been covered by Duracrete for thousands of years. One of my greatest memories of Star Wars growing up was the Knights of the Old Republic. This was a Bioware RPG, and you basically traveled around the galaxy on this ship with a crew, and one of the locations you visited was Taurus, and this was a planet-wide city like Coruscant, but a little bit smaller, a little bit more towards the outer rim. And I remember going down into the depths of the city, meeting all these kind of individuals living in the underground, criminals, refugees, business people. I mean, there was entire ecosystems formed underneath the city that had never seen the day of light. And that's always kind of fascinated me. This is probably why I love Coruscant so much till this day. I say trillions of people live on Coruscant. I mean, there's such a high concentration of living beings here. It only makes sense to make this ancient planet city the capital of the Old Republic. And it was said that in the early days of the Republic, shortly after the collapse of the Rakatan slave empire, it was from Coruscant that the first generational sleeper ships would venture out to other planets and settle them like Alderaan, Corellia, and all the other deep core planets. And it was also from Coruscant that all the first hyperspace lanes would begin to branch out and touch all these numerous worlds. And along these routes, trade, planet, culture, language, and everything else flowed and flourished. And so for most of galactic history, for most of the Old Republic's history, Coruscant has always been one of the most important planets, if not the most important planet in the galaxy. And I think this is part of the reason why the New Republic did not want anything to do with it. For all the good, the growth, and prosperity that the Galactic Republic brought to the galaxy, it also created massive amounts of corruption and bureaucracy, mostly concentrated in institutions and organizations that have held power not just for centuries, but for tens of thousands of years. We recently did a video about how most galactic industries are essentially controlled by monopolies. These companies were so massive, so heavily involved in the manufacturing of crucial items, that when there was political upheaval, changes of government, they usually survived. Heck, they oftentimes flourished, especially during times of war. And I think a lot of the corruption, a lot of the cronyism that happens in the Republic are due to these corporations, but there's also the other side of this relationship. And these are the bureaucrats, the technocrats, the legislators, the political elite, the system that has always run the galaxy, both the Republic and the Empire. Mon Mothma was worried about these people as well. 
One of the most noticeable things for me about the Empire, especially in the series Andor, was just how much bureaucratic infrastructure they had inherited from the Republic. Well, the Venators would eventually be replaced by the Imperial Class Star Destroyer, and the Clone Troopers would be replaced by the Storm Troopers. Political organizations like the Commission to protect the Republic would just be replaced by organizations like Copnor. They just basically added an end. Organizations like the Imperial Bureau of Standards remained unchanged from the Republic Measures and Standards Bureau. You know, Palpatine wasn't a fool. When he declared the rise of the Empire, the New Order, he knew he had to make gradual, gradual changes in order to adjust the galaxy to his view of how things should be done, which was just tyrannical. Even the Imperial Senate was just a direct carryover from the Republic Senate. Now, some senators were immediately purged. There were around 2,000 senators who had signed this petition during the Republic era to remove Palpatine. That just became a kill list for the ISB once Palpatine declared himself the Emperor. But the majority of senators, you know, there are a lot more than just 2,000 senators in the Imperial Senate. There were like tens of thousands. The majority of them were comfortable with the lives they were living on Coruscant. They didn't really want to lose all of their privileges. And so they just kind of stood in line and kept on doing what Palpatine wanted them to do. Even though their abilities to serve their own constituents had decreased drastically. The Imperial Senate had a facade of democracy, but Internally, it was just a rubber stamp Congress for Palpatine. And most representatives were not like Mon Matha, who was not only courageous, but also popular enough that Palpatine couldn't just remove her outright. Most of the senators, well, they were coward. Surveillance and prosecution, without limit. If you're doing nothing wrong, what is there to fear? Well, I'm fearing your definition of wrong. These are dangerous times. Dangerous times. I love the senator in green and gold. He literally just repeats what he hears. He has no opinions or any kind of, uh, you know, thoughts on policy. And this is like Tony Gilroy's smart way of showing us just how incompetent these individuals actually were. Most of them were spineless. And when presented with the opportunity to do what's right or what's good for themselves, it seems like the only ones left in the Senate were those who chose the latter. The ones who are left. I guess that's kind of the point, you know, at every level from the Galactic Post Office to the Galactic Navy, there were heroic and brave individuals who believed in the Republic and wanted to fight for the Republic. But their bravery usually got them killed or forced them to run away, maybe hide in the criminal underworld or join the rebellion. That's just what happened over the course of two decades of imperial rule. For instance, you had individuals like Commandant Pelbelo, who was in charge of the Defiance Flight Training Institute. He was secretly a Republican loyalist, and when Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader visited his ship for inspection, Belo tried to jump the ship into a star and kill everyone. Commandant Belo loved the Old Republic Navy. He had built the Old Republic Navy with his blood, sweat, and tears, and so he hated seeing it uh, become a political instrument for this emperor. But what did his brave actions ultimately yield him? Well, he got force choked to death by Darth Vader. It was examples such as this that kept most Imperials in line. Whenever tyranny takes over, the first people they target are the brave individuals who try to stand up. They understand it's crucial in those early moments to quell any sign of rebellion. And if these brave individuals, if their efforts are squashed and no one hears about their uprising, their, you know, defiance, then the middle, the masses, the individuals who run the entire system, they usually just keep their head down as well. They're not willing to stand up and fight. I mean, even if they are against the policies of the Empire at the end of the day, if they still have food on their table, if they still have some limited freedoms, they rather protect what they have than risk it all. And this is the problem that Mon Mothma and her high command faced when the war was over. Although Mon Mothma was keen to end the war as soon as possible and extend as many pardons to Imperial combatants as possible, she remembered all those former Republic bureaucrats, technocrats, policymakers, and professionals who did nothing when the Empire took over. They just kept their heads down and looked after themselves. It's not a crime for them to have done this. You can't really punish them. To do so would be tyrannical, and plus, the New Republic didn't have the legal expertise or manpower to even carry out such an operation. But the thought of the New Republic just absorbing the Empire's old institutions was something that Mon Mothma definitely didn't want to happen. Coruscant represented the old institutions. It represented the Empire and the Old Republic to people like Mon Mothma. And she wanted her new government to be untainted. And this is why she sought other places to establish her capital. 
Well, Mama Atha knew that department heads could politically be appointed. All the middle managers and underlings, the bureaucrats who actually ran the galaxy would be filled with former Imperials, most of whom did the bidding of the Empire without any thought to the consequences of their actions. Palpatine, as charismatic and cunning as he was, couldn't have really ruled over the galaxy without the silent support of these individuals. These were individuals who collected the taxes, created fiscal policies, who standardized the weight of you know, transport ships or how fuel would be shipped from one planet to another. They ran everything. Now this reminds me of a story of the chairwoman of the Russian Central Bank. Her name is Elvira Nabulina. She was your typical technocrat, a woman of numbers and rationality. She did have a slight artistic flair though. She used to wear brooches on her suit that would represent the fiscal policies she was going to try to introduce to the country and, well, the world at least in the old days. Some say she was inspired by Madeleine Albright's own use of jewelry to express what she was thinking. I think it was also just a small attempt to be creative and to show a little bit of individuality in a very serious and professional role. In her first appearance after Russia invaded Ukraine, Elvira wore all black, no brooches in sight. Was she in mourning for the death and destruction her country had unleashed on their neighbor? Or was she mourning the death of this financial relationship she had established with the West over decades. No matter what the reason was, she was blindsided by this invasion. She had no idea that it would happen like many top Russian leaders. This was Putin and Putin alone. Elvira, with her brooches and strong grasp of fiscal policy, was once seen as the face of the economic cooperation between the West and Russia. She reminded Western leaders of the same type of serious and rational individuals who controlled their own central banks. But of course, that was all a lie. Russia is actually just a kleptocracy run by a brutal gangster at the top. Despite Elvira's attempts to connect Russia with the West, the reality was this mad dictator could throw everything away, destroy all these connections, all the prosperity that the Russian people could have had by invading another country in a brutal land war. Elvira would try to resign from her position just a few weeks after the invasion occurred, but she was reportedly talked into resuming her tenure by Putin personally. She was always too valuable to fall out a window or fall out of an airplane, and it was because of her expertise in fiscal matters that Russia would be able to survive all of the sanctions levied onto it. I mean, she did increase interest rates to around 20% at the beginning of the war. Now, interest rates in Russia are climbing back into the double digits territory. But still, without her, everything would have collapsed. And so when Mon Martha looks at Coruscant, she might see old friends from her days in the Galactic Republic, competent policymakers like Elvira, individuals who might be kind-hearted and you know, truly believe in nice things, but at the end of the day, when faced with immense pressure from a brutal, tyrannical regime, they're too cowardly to actually stand up and fight. And it's these individuals that Mon Martha are extremely wary about. This is a very difficult and complicated situation for her, especially because she has roots that go all the way back to the old Republic. I think there's a part of her that just never wants to return to Coruscant ever again, so she doesn't have to deal with this uncomfortable situation. Her hope was that she could start over, attract new policymakers, a new generation of bureaucrats and professionals who could run the new Republic. Individuals who are more courageous, individuals not associated with the rot of the old Republic and the evil of the Empire. But the sad thing is I don't think it actually worked. Political factionalism would erupt the moment Mon Mothma steps down. You had the populist faction who would try to continue Mon Mothma's work of decentralizing power and pushing that more outwards to the systems and sectors. But then you also had the centrists who wanted a big, strong central government, a big military, and all of the things that Mon Motha fought against. Those individuals would actually center their operations on Coruscant. And many of these individuals would one day become open supporters of the First Order. And many would actually defect to the First Order and help establish their political system. And if you look at Mon Motha's new republic, whether it's the Imperials working in the Karelian space docks or scientists like Dr. Pershing with his immense amount of knowledge, there was no running away from the Empire and its former personnel. It was the new republic's past whether she liked it or not. The professionalism and knowledge that the Empire had a monopoly over were crucial in running the galaxy. Not even Palpatine was dumb enough to purge these bureaucrats and technocrats, and Mon Mothla was perhaps foolish to try. I'm reminded of another story in our own history, one that dates back to World War II. 
When American GIs made it to the concentration camps and witnessed the pure evil of the Nazi regime, they were disgusted by what they saw, dismayed by the utter cowardliness of Germans who did nothing and even aided the Nazi party in their evil deeds. Yet by the end of the war, President Truman had approved a secret U.S. intelligence program dubbed Operation Paperclip. They were able to recruit around 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and other professionals who were able to aid the U.S. government in research and development. Amongst them were individuals like Werner von Braun, architect of the Saturn V rocket. Apollo program director Sam Phillips was quoted saying that without him, the U.S. probably never would have reached the moon at all. The only problem was Werner von Braun was a proud Nazi member. He had been accused of having overseen concentration camps and he had employed brutal slave labor and the works. In a lot of ways, Operation Paperwork reminds me of the Republic Amnesty Program. Individuals like Dr. Pershing were involved in some truly terrifying cloning technology. Like, what the hell is he trying to do to Gogurt here? And it might be one day revealed that he was responsible for helping Palpatine return from the grave. Yet he's giving TED Talks in Coruscant and being congratulated for his bravery. Well, he seems like a genuinely nice person and an individual who truly wants to help the New Republic, he might too have blood on his hands. This is the dilemma that Mon Mothma faces. Now, Coruscant at the end of the Galactic Civil War was in complete turmoil. Gallus Rax had removed all of his troops from the area and there was basically no support over the planet. It was blockaded. And Grand Visor Masamita, the de facto leader of the Empire, was a prisoner in his own office. And he was actually guarded by Gallus Rax's men who threatened him on a daily basis. It was actually a young group of rebels known as the Ankle Biters located on Coruscant that Masamita was able to escape from his office and sign the Galactic Concordance Treaty. A peace treaty that he really had no business signing because he had no control over any forces. He was just clearly a puppet leader. But what choice did he have? I mean, Coruscant had risen up in the last year of the Galactic Civil War against them. The Empire had lost control of everything outside of the Federal District. And although there were celebrations in the streets after the war officially ended, when Mon Mothma made the crucial decision to not move the capital there, criminal elements would fill all of the vacuums left behind by these government bodies and within a few decades, by the time the First Order rises, Coruscant is just a mess. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, the democracy.